Technology at A&M University in College Station, Texas. Um, her research program focuses on the biological and environmental factors that influence the reproductive quality of honeybee queens and drones, the health and population genetics of feral honeybees, and the quality and diversity of floral sources collected by honeybees in developed areas across the country. And this morning, she is going to speak to us on factors affecting the reproductive quality of queens and drones. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Juliana Rangel to the stage. Thank you again for the invitation. And today, finally, I get to talk to you about some of our uh, more recent research on the factors that influence the reproductive quality of queens and drones. So I'm gonna walk you through, hopefully, what I'll have time to talk about. Uh, so um, mostly three research um, studies we've done on, on queen reproductive quality. So first I'll talk about what we, ta what we mean by factors that influence the reproductive quality of queens and drones. And then I'll go into a study that, taught, that looked at the effects of grafting age or developmental age of um, fertilized larvae. Uh, when chosen to be raised as a queen on adult queen physiology and worker behavior. And the more recent work that we've been doing with a grant that we received from the United States Department of Agriculture on the effects of um, commonly used agrochemicals and in-hive chemicals on queen physiology and worker behavior and the what I would call the other half of the coin, which is the effect of those chemicals on drone reproductive quality, because I argue that a lot of the issues that we have with poor queen quality in the United States um, are due to poor queen mates that the queens are mating with. And then I'll, uh, if I have time, I'll go through some future directions and conclusions. But just as a reminder, I th at some time t this afternoon, I think it's 2.30 or so, I'll be available for a QA and a uh, for about an hour or two. So if we don't have time today, I'll, uh, right now, we can entertain any questions later in the afternoon. So I had mentioned a lot of work about QMP, queen mandibular pheromone, and how it modulates behaviors in the colony. It elicits that uh, robust retinue response around the queen, whereby the workers lick, antenate, take care of the queen while she's performing the reproductive duties. It also inhibits worker ovary activation, and so colonies that are queen right with a nice um, laying queen typically have no or very few workers that activate their ovaries to lay unfertilized eggs. It also inhibits queen cell production, and that's why typically we find only one queen in the colony, unless uh, it's time for swarming or it's uh, time for emergency queering or supersedure. And QMP also does a, a few other things that are less studied, uh, including stimulating the uh, foraging of, of pollen, and it's stimulating brood rearing in incipient colonies, uh, in newly founded colonies, increasing also nectar uh, foraging in those colonies. It delays the age at onset of foraging, reduces the production of juvenile hormone, which I talked about yesterday. And of course, it attracts drones during mating in virgin queens because QMP and that bouquet of chemicals in QMP smells very differently um, in virgin queens compared to mated queens. And in fact, it's not just in mated versus uh, virgin queens, it also uh, varies depending on the queen's quality, which I will talk about, and also whether the queen was exposed to pesticides or not during development, and whether the queen was instrumentally inseminated or not. So the QMP of um, artificially inseminated queens smells very differently from the QMP from naturally mated queens. And that may be why um, instrumentally inseminated queens live a shorter life than normal queens. And that's why also you need to, if you have a very expensive breeder queen that you got inseminated by an expert, then you have a shorter window of time to graft from those colonies before the queen um, is probably superseded. So what are some of those factors that we look at that influence reproductive quality? Some of the biological factors include mating frequency. So the number of drones that the queen mates with um, is what we call mating frequency. The volume of insemination that she receives total inside the spermatheca, the sperm storing organ, upon finishing copulation with all of her mates. 
Uh, one that I'll talk about first, the age of larvae when initially raised as a queen, the amounts and levels or titers of pathogens that the queen may have, the um, composition of the gut microbiota, the beneficial microbiome that helps digest um, food properly, the sexual competitiveness of that queen and her drone partners, and something important in my lab, which is sperm viability. And so the amount of sperm cells that are present in a given uh, volume of semen and what proportion of that sperm is actually viable and could fertilize an egg, because as you will see, there's a lot of sperm that is non-viable and therefore is basically useless. Um, other environmental factors that affect queen quality include the quality of nutrition, and we talked a, a lot about uh, the, uh, many of the speakers and myself about the quality of nutrition for uh, good colony health, the exposure to pesticides that foragers come in contact with during foraging trips, both on, on their bodies and in the food that they consume, including pollen and nectar, weather patterns and changing weather patterns and the exposure to wax, of um, and food contaminated with not just agrochemicals, but most importantly and maybe more concerning is the in-hive chemicals that we as beekeepers apply to control for all those uh, pests and pathogens. So the first uh, study I'll talk about is the effect of grafting age on queen physiology and behavior. You may remember this uh, or a version of this graph uh, from two days ago where I about the variability, that there is variability in queen reproductive quality, whereby uh, you can have a gradient of low to high reproductive quality, and you have the queen uh, cast here and the workers here, and uh, somewhat of an intercast in between where you can have queens that are um, not very good, not very physically fit, very small in size, and they almost look like a worker, and sometimes you can get chubby workers, but they cannot, they don't have the reproductive machinery. So there is that critical period or age um, during which the workers can start uh, raising queens during the first, second, or third instar of a fertilized larva's life. The longer the workers wait to feed that larva royal jelly, the lower the reproductive quality going to be of, of the adult queen once she emerges and matures. So I'm going to show you some evidence for this right now. So to, do, to look at that very question, we raised super sister queens, meaning that they were uh, the daughters of the same um, mom and dad pool. And we reared them from zero day old, or I mean um, within the first 24 hours of larval life and then uh, third or between the second and third um, day of larval life. And we reared them by grafting. So how many of you are familiar with grafting? Okay, most of you. So grafting is the physical transfer using uh, uh, what is known as a grafting tool, a little uh, stick. You go in and remove what would normally be a worker larva from her cell and put them into these specialized cups that you can either get commercially made out of plastic or you can make them yourself with uh, molten beeswax and they look just like the queen cups that um, are naturally used by workers to rear queens. So we did the grafting technique and that's how mass production of queens is done is through grafting. If you put several hundred of these queen cups with those grafted larvae into a queenless cell builder uh, or cell building colony because there's no QMP and therefore there's no inhibition of queen rearing, you will get a lot of those nurses to rear uh, queens en masse. So uh, we, you can see in this picture the difference in size uh, between a one-day-old larva and a three-day-old larva. So they, the larval stage is the stage of growth, and larvae, all they do is really just eat and grow and eat and grow. So they will eat several times they, their body size within a 24, 48-hour period. So what we did is we located very young one-day-old larvae from a uh, nice um, brood patterned area uh, of a colony, and then we also grafted uh, two-day-old larvae at the same time from the same colony to be uh, reared as a queen. And then we placed 
um, them into the cell builder, as I kind of explained earlier. When you have the cells already sealed, then you can move those cells into what we call mating nucleus colonies, which are individual uh, small cohorts of, of bees in a box that will take care of a queen that emerges from a cell like such. Uh, and then it gives um, that queen the space needed for her to uh, go on orientation flights and then mating flights, mate, start laying eggs on her own. Because if you left all of those queens in the cell builder without putting them individually into nuke boxes, what would happen? They would start killing each other, right? Because they don't like company. They like to uh, there only be one queen, so they, will, they would uh, kill each other. So the question was, are there differences in worker attraction to queens reared from young versus old larvae? So again, we reared queens from high quality queens, so from the very young larvae, and then we reared queens from the old um, uh, larvae or low quality queens. And so for some of these studies, you will see the same trend where we raise them to maturity. And once we know that they're laying uh, properly worker uh, larvae, then we use them for the experiments. Uh, because again, I said that uh, virgin queens smell differently than mated queens. So we wanted to work with mated queens. And so the first thing you do is take those mated queens put them into observation colonies where you can observe the behavior of workers toward those queens. And so we place ma mated experimental queens in uh, pairs of observation colonies where we had um, a pair with one low quality queen and one high quality queen. And this was a blind experiment, so we didn't know which was which. And we looked at the way that uh, workers treated the queen. So we measured the number of workers around the queen's retinue. And this is painstaking work that typically is done by a graduate student that's paying their time before they, um, they get their, their degree. So actually, this study was done by me. So that um, I was paying my time then too. So uh, the, the workers lick and take care of that queen. And so you can count the number of workers around the queen's retinue. And interestingly, you can see differences immediately in retinue uh, robustness between high and low quality queens. And indeed, that's what we noticed, that the size, the average size of the retinue, this is the number of queens of each type, the high versus low quality queen, uh, dropped dramatically, significantly in the low quality queens that were grafted from the old larvae. That means that the queens are uh, being fed less and they're also being taken care of less and less of their QMP is being transmitted to the rest of the colony, um, to the, the rest of the colony mates. So we did a very similar study with high and low quality queens, and then we took their, uh, once they were mature, sexually mature, we took what we call morphometric measure, measurements. Um, so if you need to keep these queens alive and not uh, experiment with their uh, physiology yet, uh, there are very few things that you can do and still keep the queens alive. So one of the things that we do is do the morphometric analysis, how big the queen is in, in terms of size. So the weight and the width of the head and the thorax tend to correlate with queen fitness, although not always. And so we first got those mature uh, queens um, mated, and then before we placed them into um, empty colonies with five empty frames that only had uh, foundation. And so there were alternating foundation frames or full foundation and then strips of foundation. And so a couple of the, the strip foundation frames were placed in there in case the colonies grew strong enough that they would want to start building drone comb because that's an indication that the colony is strong enough to afford the production of drones. And so those queens, after measuring them, were placed into these um, uh, what we call nucleus colonies with a package of about three pounds of bees uh, and the, the startup frames. And then over time, we followed 
the growth of these colonies. Um, we um, uh, measured the amount of worker and drone comb produced, the amount of worker and drone brood that was uh, produced, the amount of food stored by those colonies, and the adult worker population size estimated. And that's, that takes a long time. And so what you do is you take a frame with a grid uh, in square inches, and you count how many squares are covered by whatever uh, variable you're measuring. So that takes, uh, you can take more than an hour just going through one colony at a time. So not surprisingly, uh, first off, we noticed that the high quality queens were heavier in weight. They had a wider thorax and there was a trend in having uh, a wider head, although not statistically significant. But these, these are the cool results. So for most of these, uh, for all of these graphs, you're gonna see um, in the x-axis, the day after colony establishment, day zero was the day where we placed the queen and the package of bees in that nucleus colony with just foundation frames. And we followed them throughout the spring and into the fall until we could no longer take data because robbing started being a problem. And so on the y-axis, you're gonna see the variable we measured in this case, the amount of worker comb built. And so the orange uh, lines show the high quality queen colonies and the green lines show the trajectory of the low quality queen colonies. Right away you can see that the uh, low quality queen colonies over time uh, produced or built about 20% less worker comb. They also produced about 30% less drone comb. This, is, does, this does not mean that uh, anything about worker production or drone production, but the intent, at least, of, of uh, wanting to um, produce drones and workers in that comb. So this is the, these are the results for the sealed worker brood. Typically, you look at sealed worker brood instead of open brood, because once the caps are sealed, that means it's a good indicator that um, the workers will probably emerge from those cells, although we know that sometimes they die as pupae and they get removed. But typically, you look at sealed instead of open brood production. And for most days, it was about 20% higher uh, sealed worker brood production in the high quality queen colonies. And interestingly, even though there was a lot of variability in the production of drone brood, uh, all of the low quality queen colonies did not, neither of the low quality queen colonies produced drones. So they produced, some of them produced drone comb, but they could not afford to produce actual drones. Uh, a lot of the high quality colonies didn't either, but at least some did. So it showed that, um, well, two things. One, that the low, queen, uh, low quality queen colonies couldn't afford to rear any drones, and that there is a lot of variability in drone production, and it's solely or typically based on the strength of the colony. So only very strong colonies can afford to produce drones. In terms of food production, kind of the same pattern of about uh, 15 to 20% higher food storage in the high quality queen colonies and about 20%, 25% more adults in the high quality queen, high, queen, high quality queens uh, colonies than the low quality queen colonies, indicating that there is 25% more workers to do the work, to do the foraging, to take care of the, of the brood, to build comb in those colonies um, that were reared, uh, that, that had a queen that was reared from zero day old larvae. So queens reared from younger worker larvae exhibit higher reproductive quality. And that's in many ways not new. All the commercial queen produ producers know this and typically they will graft from newly hatched larvae. But this is the first study, this was the first study that showed uh, quantitatively how impressively uh, lower the quality of queens and their colonies can be just by waiting a couple of days for the nurses to start feeding those larvae royal jelly. So the high quality queens exhibited um, differences in QMP chemical profile that was more attractive to workers. And now with the new study that I've been mentioning, it also probably had all, uh, to do with the turgor gland and cuticular hydrocarbon profiles of those queens. <clears throat> 
New colonies headed by high uh, quality queens had more work and drone comb, larger adult populations, more food stored, more worker and drone brood produced. And so it shows, this is a good um, example of how queen phenotype directly influences colony-wide phenotype and fitness. And so QMP, among other queen-produced chemicals, seems to operate as an honest signal of uh, queen quality. And so she can't really cheat, and she wouldn't want to anyway, to cheat their, their, uh, her offspring. The QMP profile is an honest indicator of how good she is, and that's why we argue that QMP and other queen-produced chemicals um, is one of the cues that leads workers to replace or supersede the queen if they don't really like that smell. It's telling them that it's something is wrong about the queen. So now we move on to the, uh, the more um, troubling results of this talk about the use of agrochemicals and in-hive chemicals and how they affect queen physiology and worker behavior. So you've uh, heard from Dr. Ramsey and myself in the last couple of days about the um, factors that are influencing colony health in the United States and the beekeeper reported colony losses. So poor winter is one of the um, main causes of self reported colony losses in uh, commercial beekeepers, uh, varroa mites, so about 56% of the colonies were lost due in part uh, to varroa mite issues, um, pesticides, about 66% of the colonies. This is from the survey that was done in 2016, so it's not the latest one, and poor queen quality, amongst other factors, right? And so I've been interested in seeing the um, any kind of interactions between the use of pesticides, varroa sites, and their effect on uh, the problems we're seeing with um, uh, very quick supersedure issues in the United States and poor queen quality. So when it comes to miticides, uh, in the fight against varroa, the idea is to help to use chemicals to reduce the abundance of the mites across apiaries. And research has shown that if you keep colonies untreated or if you do not do anything against varroa, a colony can collapse within a couple of years. So as part of an integrated pest, and nowadays it's called IPPM, Integrated Pest and Pollinator Management Program um, for honeybee health, the use of certain products can indeed help improve the health of the colony and uh, lower maro uh, varroa mite levels. But of course, we've seen the other side of the issue, the development of the mites resistance to most of the miticides that we use in the United States, or at least the harsh ones. And now we're seeing more and more studies on the sublethal effects of these chemicals um, to treat uh, for varroa on not just workers, but also queens and um, drones. So not surprisingly, honeybees, because they have the foragers that go in and out of the colony, um, accumulate contaminants at levels that are uh, detrimental to the health and productivity of the colony. And now we see more and more of these studies that show synergistic or interactive effects between pesticides, uh, varroa stress, uh, and other stressors on colony declines. In particular, uh, again, I am interested in the stressors of, uh, that are brought forth by Varroa and our treatment of this uh, parasite, including in, in particular two products that were used in the United States in the 1990s. Um, the first uh, miticide that was used was Taufluvalinate, which is a pyrethroid. Um, and within a decade, the most mite populations in the United States became resistant to fluvalinate. And so in the 2000s, um, as an emergency measure, we were allowed to use the uh, organophosphate cumafos. And within about a decade, the mites became resistant to cumafos. So those products, Apivar and Checkmite Plus, I don't know if you've ever seen them, or I don't know if you can use them in New Zealand, uh, but th most mite populations are now resistant or, uh, to, to those products. So nowadays we use the um, formamidide amitraz, and that is what we're using right now uh, most commonly, at least in commercial operations, for the control of varroa. 
In the past, there had been a few studies that showed the effect of either one or the other, fluvalinate or cumofos, on uh, queen reproductive health, showing uh, that high levels of these products would lower uh, the ovarian uh, weight of queens, lower sperm viability, and increased queen mortality even before they were able to emerge from their cells. So our goal was to look at the more realistic uh, current scenario where uh, we see a lot of combinations of these chemicals, especially in the wax matrix where the larvae, the queen larvae, are developing. So to do these types of experiments, we, you'll see kind of the same theme where we use those queen cups that I mentioned earlier made of plastic, but this time they were coated were, with molten beeswax that was either certified miticide free or that was spiked with built relevant concentrations of these chemicals. Uh, in, the, in this particular study, uh, fluvalinate and cumofos. So we had two groups, the nomadicide treatment that we used uh, back in, uh, when I was in North Carolina um, uh, working with Dr. David Tarpey, uh, Burt's Bees, I don't know if you're familiar with that brand, was based out of North Carolina. Um, and so we would buy or uh, get the wax from them. They used to source the wax from Kenya uh, a country that does not use miticides for mite control, for raw mite control. And then we spiked that molten beeswax with um, the field relevant concentrations of those two chemicals. So in 2010, there was a very uh, pivotal study, very expensive study uh, by Mullen et al. out of Penn State, and I will mention this study a few times, uh, where they surveyed uh, more than 250 commercial beekeeper operations in the United States. Um, and you know that those are uh, people that uh, manage over a thousand colonies each. And a lot of them are migratory and they go to uh, uh, fulfill pollination services <coughs> across the country. And they screened bees, so the the uh, on top of the of bees' bodies to see what was on the bees in terms of chemical residues, pollen, um, w uh, nectar, and wax samples from each one of those 259 colonies from the commercial beekeeping operations. In the U.S., uh, there's only a few places where you can get pesticide residue testing, and the one that is uh, the, through the United States Department of Agriculture charges about $200 a sample. So you can imagine uh, having 1,000 samples times $200, that's at least $200,000 that you would need to carry out a study of this magnitude. So we use those concentrations that, um, that they reported in the wax matrix. And so again, we, this is my uh, graduate student, Liz Walsh, who will be graduating this December. And she um, um, grafted, again, experimental queens uh, in those cups that were coated with either the miticide free or the miticide laden um, uh, beeswax. And so then we followed the whole routine of putting the, the, the grafts into the cell builders and then the cell builders, the nurses in the cell builders reared queens, not all of them, but some of them. You lose queens at every step of this process. So let's say you graft 100, you only get uh, maybe an 80% take, so only 80 of them get fed and start developing. Then of those 80%, you might lose another 80, uh, 20% that don't make it all the way to the pupation stage. Then you might lose another 20% that don't make it to the emergent state. And then you might lose another 20 that don't make it to the sexually mature post-mating state. And so it's really difficult to get these uh, queens at the end. But in any case, uh, we managed to get enough of them. So we got mature uh, cells, or mature queens, sorry, that emerged from these mating nucleuses. Um, and we used those emerged queens for measurements. So one of the things that we, we do in our lab, as I mentioned earlier, is the sperm count and sperm viability analysis. So if you pop a spermatheca from a queen and you put it in a buffer solution, uh, you can look at it under the scope and this is what it looks like. A bunch of really um, 
dark heads, and then the, if you saw the pictures a couple of days ago, really long tails uh, for the sperm. And so then you measure basically within this volume how many sperm cells do you count and what percentage of those are viable. And to do the viability analysis, you have to put um, two dyes, one that fluoresces green, one that fluoresces red under uh, certain filters, and the ones that fluoresces green are viable, and the ones that fluoresce red are non-viable, and that's how you can take that ratio of viable to non-viable to get sperm viability. So we counted the, just the, the sperm counts overall, the total amount of sperm cells in a volume in the no mitocide versus the F plus C or fluvalinate and cumulophos treatment, and you can rapidly see that there was about half of uh, the sperm cells in the mitocide treatment compared to the control, so very troubling. And then we counted the number of alive cells or viable cells in that um, uh, volume, and it was even more troubling because there was maybe about a third of the viable sperm cells in the F plus C treatment group. So if you take the ratio of alive over total, that's what you get uh, in terms of sperm viability. And so we saw about a 20, 25% drop in viability in the sperm of queens that were reared in the F plus C uh, wax. Remember, this is just wax that was contaminated, nothing else. So likely uh, what's going on, and that's something that we are now interested in looking at, is whether these chemicals are leaching into the the royal jelly that the larvae are consuming, and that's how they're getting some of those pesticides in their physiology. So Liz is looking uh, more closely at these questions on the effects of these chemicals on queen physiology and worker behavior. Um, and so she is um, doing kind of a full circle um, study of a comprehensive study of, of these questions of pesticide um, effects on queen physiology. So she's also looking at uh, retinues and the retinue size. So we hypothesize that those queens that were reared in the pesticide-laden environment would elicit a smaller retinue, just like you saw in the other study. But also, she paid attention to egg-laying capacity. So we wanted to see if the egg-laying capacity of those queens was compromised. The speed at which they rear uh, young uh, was compromised. So we used the same study, Mullen et al., to look at the concentrations of the wax that we, um, of those pesticides in wax. So again, there's two categories, uh, pesticides and fungicides, so we will call those the agrochemicals, and then the in-hive chemicals, which are the uh, fluvalinic, cumulophos, and amitraz um, miticides that beekeepers apply. So this is the very top of the, the table that we were interested in. This, by the way, the study, even though it was done in two, about almost now 10 years ago, a paper that came out of the Don, uh, Van Engelsdorp lab just a, maybe a month ago or so, showed that still like 85% of beekeeper operations have uh, residues of the same chemicals in the United States. So it's still a prevalent problem. Even though we've stopped, for the most part, using fluvalinate cumulophos to treat for varroa, the wax continues to be recycled and used and lipophilic, so it like, acts like a sponge, and over time it keeps accumulating more and more of these chemicals. So this paper is, by the way, is. Um, open access, uh, so you can just download it. You look up Mullen et al. agrochemical, and, and it's free to download. And it shows you that they have several tables. It's a very dry paper, but it has a lot of information because it's a bunch of tables. Uh, so this is the summary of pesticides in wax, but there's one for, as I said, pollen, one for uh, nectar, one for bees, like their bodies. They washed the bees' bodies and, and uh, ran that through the chemical machine. And so this is the one that we were interested in, was the one for wax. Um, so the top two agrochemicals are the um, insecticide chlorpyrifos, an organophosphate, which has been banned in some places now because it shows um, that it, it affects not just um, other animals, but also humans. Um, 
and chlorothalonil, which is a fungicide. And so if I had time, you know, and to give you 10 talks, I could talk to you about the work that we've done on the effects of fungicides on worker uh, health. And one of the issues with fungicides and herbicides is that they don't have such stringent uh, regulations uh, for use on plants than uh, insecticides do because they're tar targeting fungi or herbs or, or plants. So in other um, kingdoms of life, and so they didn't, uh, it's not really thought of as an herbicide causing non-lethal uh, non effects to bees, but in fact, now we see the, uh, the work that actually has come out of mostly the um, University of Texas at Austin. There are nemesis in sports, in football. Um, uh, Dr. Nancy Moran, she's a member of the National Academies of Science. She's at UT Austin and she's the one that has uh, published all the work on the gut microbiome of, of workers, and then we did a study together on the mi microbiome of queens, and she recently reported that there's disruption in the gut microbiome in workers that are um, exposed to glyphosate, which is an herbicide, right? It's in a very popular weed killing uh, product. And um, so fungicides and herbicides, and surprise, surprise, of the top five, there's a fungicide up there in the uh, wax that we find inside colonies. So we wanted to look at those two, the top two agrochemicals, and then the miticides used by us, the beekeepers, and not surprisingly, fluvalinate is at the top, cumofos number two, and the MPF, which is a metabolite of amitraz, what the th was the third product in um, the my, in the miticide group. So of course we could have focused on I wish we had had funding and time to go through the top 10. Um, interestingly, if you look at the study, you will see uh, they get a lot of media attention, but you will see that neonicotinoid systemic insecticides are like on page two or three of this list and almost at not detected levels. So uh, I'm more concerned with the ones that are really high levels and that are more ubiquitous and um, prevalent in our wax samples. So now kind of you, you've heard the drill of the queen cup preparation. This is what those cups and the cells look like, very similar to a, a, a natural queen cell. And so the only difference is that these cups are coated with about 200 milligrams of molten wax. And so we had a control group um, that was pesticide free and then we had three experimental groups and this, this time we grouped them by their prevalence. So we had fluvalinate and cumofos in one group, amitraz on its own in the other group and then chlorpyrifos and chlorothalonil, the uh, insecticide and fungicide together in uh, the third experimental group. So we grafted one-day-old larvae. Now we know that we had to do the one-day-old within the 24-hour period, because otherwise you would know that the quality of that queen is compromised if we had waited longer for the grafting. We introduced those queen cells into queenless cell builders, allowed the queens to mature and mate naturally. Once they were mated and they were um, they successfully survived this whole process, then they were placed into randomly chosen up three frame observation colonies, so we would match them, one control queen and one experimental queen, and then looked at pairs of these observation colonies for all of those behaviors. And so at any given time, she had only enough um, eyes and, and ears and hands to um, look at eight, uh, colonies at a time, but she looked at several of these pairs over the course of two, two summers. She did, well, she has been doing a lot of different experiments with these queens because they're really precious queens. So one of the things that is done in tandem with the um, chemical analysis of the, the queen mandibular pheromone studies with, where you dissect the contents of the gland is to do um, behavioral bioassays with nurse aged or um, retinue aged workers to see how they are, how attracted they are to the contents 
of those glands. And so you do typically uh, in these kinds of studies, you do both. You uh, save some of your uh, QMP contents or gland contents for the GC or gas, gas chromatography mass spectrometry analysis, and that's the one that gives you the peaks and relative abundance of all the chemicals that are present in any sample you give the machine. Or the other half is saved so that you can then put it in a diluent like hexane and then give it, you smear it on glass slides and you put two slides in a cage, one containing the smears of the control queen and one containing the smear of the gland content of your experimental queen. And then, so you have to first take, um, did, did anyone remember, if you were at the lecture yesterday, what you call one of these baby bees that just came out? Very good. Oh, you're cheating. You knew that. Teneral babies that came out of, of their little cell, and they're fuzzy, and they look like teddy bears, and you can manipulate them because they don't really sting. So you put those teneral bees into, uh, you, you put a, a frame of emerging brood in an incubator, then collect the tenoral one-day-old um, uh, workers and collect them in cohorts, wait about five days until they reach that uh, nurse HBH, and then you use them for these caged uh, bioassay tests. And so we put about um, 20 to 30 of these workers in the cages and offered them the two slides, and then we would just count how many of them there were on, the, on each one of the slides at every five minute interval or so. And the one, uh, you, you take the content of a gland and you mix it with a diluent and then that is known as a one queen equivalent. And so we would use half of that for each of the tests. Um, so it's the equivalent of one queen's worth of gland content. I don't know if that makes any sense. Anyway, and then after that, we would run the, the samples through the GCMS to look at what chemicals are present. But kind of more interestingly in behavioral uh, ecology is, uh, again, retinue size. So I don't know if you can see here, but this queen has a very robust, round retinue with about 15 workers around her, while this queen here is not receiving uh, the royal treatment, if I will by those workers um, because she's not probably not very attractive to them. And she also looked at egg laying rate. So how many eggs were laid by that queen in a five minute period every 60 minutes for, I don't know, two years of Liz's life <laughs> and, and um, until we got enough uh, observations done. So these are, these are the data for the number of bees on the cage bioassay slides. Um, we saw a significant difference or a significant drop in the number of bees attracted to the slides in the queens that were reared in the amitraz laden wax compared to the control, and the same and even more dramatic decrease in the attractiveness of the contents of the QMP in the queens that were reared in the F plus C group compared to control. We did not see a significant difference uh, between control and the agrochemical um, race queens. More interestingly, we saw a drop in, a significant drop in the retinue size in all of the treatment groups compared to the control group. Uh, so fewer um, numbers around the queen's retinue taking care of her, probably feeding her, and just grooming her and tending her in the experimental groups compared to the, uh, the control queens. And the same thing in the number of eggs laid by the queen. So a significant drop in egg laying capacity in the queens that were reared in the experimental groups compared to the control queens. So there are synergistic effects of these miticides and agrochemicals on wax. Uh, on queen reproductive health, and compared to those that are reared in pesticide-free wax, the queens that are reared in the pesticide-laden wax had lower total number of sperm cells, 
lower average number of alive sperm cells, lower sperm viability, smorker, smaller worker retinues, lower egg laying rate. And so now she's looking at finishing up the QMP chemical composition, mating frequency, so how many workers the, the sorry, drones the queen made it with, the number of ovarials, and the sperm viability in those queens. So to finish off, I kind of mentioned the biology of drones yesterday, and my student that's now a postdoc of Arizona State University, uh, Adrian Fisher, did kind of the same thing, but instead she, he used uh, drone, plastic drone comb, and he coated it with either miticide or chemical laden, or side free with the same treatments and we he then aged them like I told you yesterday every day he would collect emerging drones and age them by painting them and so 30 or 10 15 days later he would know how old they were and then he ran them through the next alum cell counting machine that allowed him or us to know the cells the sperm cells in these popped drones in the semen were viable or not and that's what they like viable versus non-viable sperm cells. And look at the results just really quick. Um, dramatic drop in sperm viability in the drones that are reared in the fluvalinate and cumafos group, in the chlorothalonil and chlorpyrifos group compared to the sperm viability in control drones, and the same for amitraz laden wax. Dramatic decrease. So basically what I want to with is that there are many factors that affect the reproductive quality of queens and drones. We continue to do this work, but uh, it's very true that we have so many um, chemicals that are affecting sublethally the uh, quality of queens and drones, and not only pay attention to queens, but also um, drones in this integrated pest and pollinator protection management to increase um, colony health. So I will be around in the afternoon, but this has been a delight, and I am really humbled and, and appreciative of the invitation to have come and speak to you and your group. So thank you again.